Good morning and welcome back to church, especially to those of you who are here physically. Uh, some of you have, have not seen you for maybe more than six months, even more longer than that. Good to see all of you and good to see all of you who are online, who are joining us this morning. No matter where you are, it may be evening from, from those of you who are on the other side of the world. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our hybrid service. To start, I would like to read a verse from the scripture. And I'd like you to turn me to Psalm 105. If you have your Bibles on your phones or you actually have the physical Bible, turn with me to Psalm 105. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 5. Psalm 105, to just prepare our hearts and our, our minds and allow God to remind us why we are gathering this morning. Psalm 105, verse 1 to verse 5. He says, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the peoples, sing to Him, sing praises to Him, tell of all His wondrous work. Glory in His holy name, let the, hearers, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and His strength, seek His presence continually, remember the wondrous works that He has done, his miracles, and the judgments he uttered. I think you, a lot of us have gone through this whole year with a lot of ups and downs, and we're at a place, man, some of you are feeling exhausted uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, socially, but the Lord is good and He reminds us to seek Him and not to seek just a short-term temporary uh, solution. But He is the ultimate solution to our problems. And especially in this time of Christmas, to just take time to remind ourselves about how good our God is. Now I'm going to go into a time of announcement. And I have to make a few announcements to those of, for those of you who are online and join us on time. Uh, I think there's about 20 of you so far. And there's another bunch of you who will join us a little bit later, but let me make the announcement, and uh, the first announcement is that, again, we have sufficient space. Some of you have called me and then asked me, Pastor, is there enough space? Shall I give it up for others? I assure you there's enough for, for those of you who are interested. Uh, there's 40 slots for worshippers to come physically back to church, and you'll hear actually more updates that those of you at home can't hear if you are here. Uh, uh, so it's the registration starts and opens Tuesday morning to Thursday. Tuesday morning to Thursday. We close the registration at about 11.59. Don't worry, I do not make Sarah, my new admin assistant, work at 12 o'clock. I don't make her check it at midnight. But it's just in a way we're closing at 11.59. And Friday morning, we'll send out the confirmation. And do know that if you have registered once, we'll keep your name on the list unless you inform us that you can't make it. So you don't have to re-register every time you get the email, right? If you already registered for one attendance, we'll keep it on unless you tell us you won't be coming. As some of you have done, it says you want to come back next year in Jan or something. We'll, we'll just take note of that. So we'll put your name on it. But for those of you who are new, please register via the WhatsApp, via the Facebook message or the email. All of them works and we'll put your name on the list. The next announcement is, of course, that to facilitate some of you for, to come back, we also have gained approval for you to come to church for the Sabbath school classes. You can come here and there'll be places allocated for you to join the Zoom classes that you've been a part of all this time. So you don't have to lose that. It's not going to go away and it will give you sufficient time after the class ends to join the worship service. So you can come here at 9.45. You have to indicate that in the email, WhatsApp or Facebook message to, to, for us to know. So you can come at about 9.45. There'll be places allocated to you, and you can join in the Zoom classes for your Sabbath school. And then after that, at about 10.45, you have to kind of wind down, close up, and because we have to get ready for the live stream to start. So that is available. That is available. The next announcement is something that uh, I'm really excited. Uh, it's that time of the year again. Some of you may know that I really like Christmas. I start playing Christmas songs in November in my car. Uh, of course, I'm not a shopping center, but uh, yeah, I like that. Uh, so, so the thing is, as that Christmas spirit, we started a, a thing last year. And unfortunately, we can't do it again this year as part of the church initiative because I can't see a lot of you. But I encourage those of you who participated last year or those who didn't to, to start this year. Remember, I gave out some give backs last year and I asked you to fill it up. Fill it up with gifts and give it to somebody that is around you that you think won't get anything for Christmas or they don't know what Christmas is about or is somebody that you know is 
often underappreciated to show your personal appreciation. So, so uh, you can go buy a gift bag. It's available all around. Pack it up with, with some gifts and give it to somebody and, and just share the Christmas spirit with them. You know, I know some of you sent me photos. I was looking for it. I couldn't get it ready. I'll show you next week. I know some of you had uh, did it and then you took a photo and you sent it to me. I'll show you. I know I have uh, quite a few of them. So next week, you will see some of the photos of what people did last year and who they gave it to. But I want to encourage the church, ESDAC, to continue, to continue this. You know, Christmas is a time of sharing the love of God. And the biggest thing that He did for us is He gave His Son to die for us on the cross. And so let us not just... Focus on the food, focus on the parties, but let us remember those who are underappreciated and may not know Jesus yet. So that's the thing that I'm not going to share with you. And on top of that, what I'm really excited about Christmas this year is that on Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, 26th of December, which is a Sabbath, we're going to have our third baptism for this year. We're going to have our third baptism. So despite the lockdown, despite COVID, we are still having people committing to baptism and joining the church. So our third baptism will be held on the 26th of December, and uh, I'll share more with you next week. Um, but the person that we, we all know his family really well, and I hope that you really get to know him very well. But there's some of you who, who told me you want to get baptized at the beginning of the year, but because of COVID, we stopped it. We, we postponed it, and uh, we have not been able to work out a date. So if you are ready and you've been waiting for, for, to be baptized, 26th of December, there's still space for you. So let me know and we'll work it out. If not, let's make arrangements for next year. Because now we've been allowed to do baptism, so let's not wait anymore for those of you who have been prepared, who think you're ready and you're willing to commit to the community. Let me know and we'll arrange for it, right? So 26th is going to be one. I pray for two. I know there's one person that is uh, still deciding, right? So pray, praise God. Praise God for this that's happening. And that uh, we're, ha- we're able to have uh, baptism in the midst of this pandemic. Thank God for that. So shall we bow our heads for a word of prayer as we prepare our hearts? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath. We thank you for the Advent. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, God, for your love. And Lord, teach us, help us, that in the midst of all this violence, separation, racism, discrimination, people hating against each other, people rising against people, countries against countries. May we show them another way. May we show them the way of the kingdom of God where love drives us, where love unites us, where we are united in the spirit to worship one God. Help us this morning as we come to you in, in worship, no matter where we are joining this worship from. Help us to, to, to share this love to those around us and help us to love you more each and every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm not sure whether it's going to work. I'm going to hand the time over back to our praise and worship team who is leading worship from next door. And uh, I hope that those of you online can hear them. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, As Christmas is drawing near, uh, we'll be starting to sing some Christmas carols that all of you are very familiar with. So if you do know the song, please uh, sing along or hum along with us. So as we prepare our hearts uh, for worship, let us now sing our first song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Oh, oh, oh. 
Indeed, it's a time where we remind ourselves about how God, our God, how good our God is, and praise Him and, and bring some Christmas spirit into our lives to the church. This year, the church doesn't smell like Christmas because usually we have real Christmas tree in the church and you can smell it. Uh, this year, we're not having that. Uh, but I hope that wherever you are here or home, that you will still remember the Christmas spirit. That's the time for tithes and offerings. And uh, I've got uh, some question to just ask me or just to re reiterate how to do it. All right. So for the QR code that you see on the screen is for you to scan from your camera QR code scanner, not for PayNow. Uh, I still have people saying they can't pay using PayNow with the QR code. It is not for PayNow. You scan the QR code, it'll bring you to adventistgiving.sg. It's a portal for the church where you can choose three different options. And the options are you can create an account. When you create an account, what, what the benefit of that account is all your tithe and offering receipts will be stored there electronically and accessible to you immediately after it, it goes through and you, for you to refer to any time. Like any other uh, online portal for e-commerce is a very similar concept. So you don't have to check with the treasurer, don't have to check with the conference for your receipt. So that's one option. And when you, when you create the account, after you fill in your, all your information of giving, like you fill in the tithe envelope, it'll bring you to the actual choice of whether you want to pay from with your credit card, with PayNow, or internet transfer. And if you choose PayNow, for those of you who are concerned, then the QR code for PayNow will pop up. Then you can pay with the PayNow uh, on, your, on your phone. Uh, a lot of layers, uh, a lot of, uh, but we're just trying to please everybody. <laughs> but the best is if you want to, uh, you can arrange for automatically giving uh, through your internet transfer, and that will save you a lot of hassle. That's one option. Second option is you can choose one time giving. You don't have to create an account, you don't have to do anything, and you'll be filling in the information as with the tithe and offering envelope, and then you click, and then the options come up credit card, QR, uh, pay now, internet transfer pops up. You don't have to create an account. And, uh, but the thing is, you won't have your receipt stored online. You can refer to it as readily. All right. So, so these are the options. But at the end of the day, um, you know, this is for you to show your appreciation and thankfulness to God for how He's taking care of you. And I know, as that for for anybody, as that people has been very faithful and and showing their gratefulness to God. And um, thank you for that. I'll give you a time for you to to do it in prayer and as worship to give your tithe and offering. Word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for taking care of us and to still allow us to return to you what you've given us to steward. Father Lord, help us to see those who are in need and help us to, to give, knowing that Lord, we're about steward of what you've given to us and this. you've given to the church enough resources to take care of those who are in need. And there are some around us that may be too shy to ask for help, maybe we, we don't notice them, or they just, you know, they don't even realize that, 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 that this church can support them. Help us to see those people and continue to be your conduit to share the, the resources you've given to us. We submit all this into your hand with gratefulness and thankfulness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to pass the time back to our praise and worship team.
So now uh, let us prepare our hearts for the Garden of Prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful Sabbath morning, Lord. Thank you for your love, thank you for your grace, and I thank you for your protection, especially during these pandemic days, dear Lord. Bless each and every one of us who have gathered here, and also those who are joining virtually, Lord. Send us your Holy Spirit and open our minds and hearts to receive you, my Lord. Help us to listen to your voice and submit ourselves to you. I especially Pray for the sick and the needy. Guard them and protect them, dear Lord. I also pray for Uncle Melvin and Aunt King's family. May you grant them peace and blessings from above. Lord, I pray for the speaker of the hour, Brother Lionel. Let you speak through him and enlighten our soul to get closer to you. Let our thoughts, words and actions be acceptable to you. May your name be glorified and our lives be changed, Lord. We pray for your mercy and grace, and I ask these few blessings in your precious name. Amen. Again, for those of you who have joined us, welcome to the ESDEC hybrid service. Hybrid because some people are here and some people are everywhere. Uh, every, every time I look at the stats, it surprises me where people are joining us from. So for those of you who are from the places that I know, good evening. Uh, I know there's a Canada, a lot of American people joining us um, late at night. Uh, so thank you for joining us and choosing to worship together with us. So for those who have just joined us, the announcements are going to be repeated for your sake and for those, for those who have want to hear it again. So from next, next Sabbath, not from next Sabbath, next Sabbath, we have 40 worship slots open, worshiper slots open. So don't worry about not having enough space. We have enough space. And if you're interested to come back for worship, do note that the email, WhatsApp message will come on Tuesday and the registration will close by 11.59 p.m. on Thursday. And then the confirmation email will be sent out on Friday to confirm your registration. So for those of you who have already registered, you do not need to register again. So you only need to let me know if you cannot make it for that Sabbath. I'll keep your name on the list. And if you can't make it, let me know. I'll take it out. Or you can tell me how long you won't be able to make it, right? So I'll keep you on it. So for those of you who are interested, you can come back. And to facilitate that, we have made arrangements. We've gained approval for you to come here to church for Sabbath school. For Sabbath school. So what can happen is not... We actually can move towards having it in person, but I know some of you are having such a good time on the Zoom Sabbath School classes that you, you don't really want to have it in physically yet. Uh, awesome, right? But if you still want to participate in those online Sabbath School classes and you, you want to come to worship and you're worried you won't have enough time to get here, you can apply and let me know, just register and let me know that you want to do that. And you can come here from 9.45 onwards. We'll allocate separate spaces around the building for you and you can have your Sabbath school there, joining the Zoom classes, and then at 10.45, you end it, and then you can come here and join the worship. So again, 
Let me know through the WhatsApp messages. Let me through know the, through email or the Facebook messages that if you want to come here for your Sabbath school classes, all right? That is approved, that is allowed. All right, the next thing I'm going to talk about that uh, is, is that what we did last year is called the SDEX Christmas Spirit. And what we did last year is I gave out gift bags, empty ones without any gifts, and I asked the church to fill it up with gifts uh, and to give it to somebody that you, is within your circle of influence that you feel is underappreciated or somebody who have never experienced Christmas or somebody who will really be blessed by receiving this gift during this time. I think this year especially uh, we need to do this. There's a lot of people around us who are suffering physically, emotionally, socially, mentally. And I, I think a, receiving a gift from a stranger, may not be like a, a stranger stranger, but an acquaintance, somebody unexpected, will really lift up their spirit. And I think Christmas is the time to do that. Christmas is the time to do that. And I know some of you did that last year. I have the photos. I'll show you the photos next week of what, what some of the things that they did. So if you can, not much time left. Today's the 12th of December with about two weeks-ish towards to Christmas. Get the gift bags from everywhere around you. I'm not going to sell any shops. <laughs> and then you can go and fill it up with things you think that person might need and will, will be blessed by. All right? So let's do that and take a photo and let me know. Let me know what you did. And then we're going to share with the church and share with people that we're trying to share the Christmas spirit. All right? So that's, that's that. And then on top of that, the, the cherry topping is that on the 26th of December, the day after Christmas Day, we're going to have our third baptism of 2020. Despite not being able to meet physically together, despite the fact that we, we couldn't really, you know, interact as much, uh, we have a lot of restrictions, we still have people convicted to join the community. And we know and we're reminded that that is the work of the Holy Spirit and it's not us. And so we're going to have that on the 26th. And if you are one of those who actually have prepared yourself for baptism, you've gotten ready, and, and you just didn't have an opportunity. I know at least there's one of you that we were supposed to do it, but the COVID struck and then we postponed it. Um, let me know. And if you want to do it on 26, we, we can ha make it happen. If not, well, let's make arrangements for next year, all right? So if you are ready to get baptized, let me know. And there's some of you who actually have been thinking about this or have not thought about it, but now you're thinking about it because I mentioned it. You want to know how, how, how to do, what's the process like? Let's talk. Let's talk, and I'll share with you what, what it's like to, in ASDEC to be prepared for baptism and to get baptized, right? So let's have a chat about that, but do, do uh, everybody, we need to celebrate that on the 26th, we have another one joining us. All right? So now it's my turn to get off the stage and hand the time over to, to our dear Rolf, and uh, he hasn't been with us for a while. I'm so glad to see him in person, and he's back. He went through the 14-day quarantine in order to come back, but I'll just let him uh, explain what's going to happen next. Well, it is a uh, long time going, and uh, other churches have done it a long time ago. It is to show appreciation to the pastor. I'm sorry James was so late, but we thought it's uh, better late than never. So here today, we actually would like to show our appreciation uh, to the pastor. And I would like to borrow a famous sentence from John F. Kennedy when he was inaugurated, which was basically, uh, you should not ask what the pastor or his family can do for you or for the church, but you should actually ask, what can I or we as a church do for the pastor and his family? So today... That's what we want to do. We want to take a brief moment to show our appreciation to the pastor and his family. Now, his family was supposed to be here, but um, I understand for some technical reasons it's not possible. And maybe that's a good thing, because if Lucas were here, he would probably steal the entire show. So you have to represent the family, and we'll be happy to have you present. Uh, so before um, we go over to some gift giving, I th understand that the youth has uh, also something prepared for you. So I would like to ask Daniel, as the representative from the youth, to come up and uh, present the thoughts from the youth. So I think you have to take my microphone. Sorry about that. Yeah, so uh, hi. So uh, representing all the youth and the young adults, uh, I would like to just uh, thank Pastor James uh, for this year for really being our friend, first of all. 
and for being our guide and also our role model. And um, I also like to thank Pastor James personally to, for really bringing me out of the CV period and allowing me to survive through that uh, really difficult time. <laughs> yeah. And um, although we weren't able to like, meet up a lot of times, uh, but we still met through Zoom, and uh, I really want to thank Pastor James for that as well. And I think I'm representing all the young adults and the youth uh, when I'm saying um, really thank you, Pastor James, for being our pastor as well. Yeah. And um, we just prepared a small uh, handmade scrapbook with some photos and uh, messages. Um, you probably know who made this. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I would like to present this to you uh, to show our gratitude. Yeah. It's a bit... Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, and happy Pastor Appreciation Day. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to pass the time to Uncle Michael to say a few words. Yeah. Good morning. Um, Uncle Rolf and Daniel have said a lot of good things about a pastor. I'm not sure whether the whole church uh, agree to all that, but uh, we will find out. Uh, in my hand are two envelopes. They are exactly the same. They look exactly the same, but the uh, contents may not be. All right? So I'm going to ask the pastor uh, in a little while to come up and uh, select one. Uh, if he chooses the one with some nice things inside, then he will know that our church appreciates him very much, and we want him to stay on. However, if he chooses the one with some toilet paper inside, then you will know that the church uh, is suggesting that maybe uh, there's another better church for you. <laughs> okay, so uh, shall we uh, ask pastor to come? You choose one, and then you open it and see, all right? Okay. Good luck to you. Oh. <laughs> This is it, as back. This is it. <laughs> okay. Okay. And open it. Not toilet paper. Ah, it's not. It's not toilet paper. <laughs> oh, it's not toilet paper. <laughs> oh, okay. You're lucky. <laughs> well, what do I do with the toilet paper? <laughs> well, anyway, I think uh, if the church members who don't seem to agree with that uh, still love you, you will see colored toilet paper inside. <laughs> If it is all white, then I think that's the end, okay? <laughs> so I cannot give this to you, sure. and, and you have a look inside and see what okay. it is. It is not toilet paper. Okay, so. you want to can we see the color? Uh, no, blue, cannot. blue color. Oh, blue color, blue okay. Color. <laughs> well, actually, I, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Do you ever think that we don't appreciate our pastor? I was talking nonsense all the time, but just to, for a little bit of humor, I want you to know that our church appreciates uh, Pastor James Tam, ever since he came to our church about eight or nine years ago, and we do not want to let him go, <laughs> if possible. So, thank you, thank Pastor you. James, for being our pastor for so many years. I hope that uh, we have not, not worn your patience off. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. thank, you. thank you very much. Well, I think uh, Michael said it all in a humorous fashion. Um, there is nothing we appreciate you more than, uh, and your family for being here and being our pastor and guiding us. And uh, having said that, we also would like to be here for you. Uh, sometimes um, I know we tend to forget that, but uh, Today, I think we would uh, double up. We would like to double up with the two envelopes, for example, <laughs> uh, but also with some other stuff. And uh, I'm sorry, you have no help. You will have to carry it home yourself. <laughs> but um, I may give you this one. I'm not sure how we do this. <laughs> it's actually quite It's actually quite heavy. I have to hold it with both hands. So here we go. Thank you. So something Thank you. to enjoy with the entire family. And of course, we don't want to forget Lucas. Okay. <laughs> so we also um, brought something for Lucas. Thank you so much. Now, since he's not here, you will have to carry it home <laughs> for him. Okay. So here we go. Thank you so much. 
Thank you very much. Now, you may want to put it down. We would like to have a word of prayer with you. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for Pastor James and his family. We thank you that you send him here and that he has been our pastor for the last seven or eight years. We thank you that for all the ministry he has done, for helping the church to grow, to, for helping the church to come together. And we thank you for just be here as a human being and guiding us. Now, as we come together today, we would like to place him and his family, Tiffany and Lucas, in your hands. We would like to ask you that you continue to bless them, to guide them, and to be with them as they seek daily connection with you and be together with you. We also ask you that you help them to find time to enjoy together, despite all the load of the church and all the work done, that James finds the priorities and knows that the family is the center of his strength with you in the middle. We also ask you, dear Father, that you continue to encourage him and give him courage because we are aware of the fact that a pastor, you will, you're not always encountering uh, nice words or um, members who enjoy you, but also members who criticize, members who think they know better. So we ask you that you give him courage to Stand firm to represent you, but also to respond in grace and in lovingness that um, people can see that he is guided by you and the Holy Spirit and not by, driven by self. As he prepares the, the sermons and the spiritual manna for us as a church, it can sometimes be difficult um, serving the same church for so long that um, one runs out of idea. Now, we haven't had this impression so far, but we still would like to ask that you continue to give him the ideas for the spiritual manna, which we as a church need and we as a church um, can benefit from so we can give back to him, to his family, but also to our neighborhood Amen. and to our people around us. And lastly, but not least, show us how we can be here for Tiffany, Lucas, and James, how we can serve them, lift them up, and show them on a weekly, on a daily basis that we appreciate them and that we are so glad to have them in our midst. And then when we all are able to come together again, we look forward to have Tiffany and Lucas here together with everybody else and uh, with James being our pastor in the middle. We thank you that you be with us and guide us and guide James and his family on a continuous basis. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You know, one thing that uh, I, I didn't mind waiting is because one thing that you, in as that you don't feel underappreciated. Uh, I, I, I didn't need a special day to be reminded that as that appreciate and loves me. And even during this time, the love and the community in this church has been ongoing. So thank you very much, as that, for supporting my wife, my kid, and me during our time here. And yeah, it's been eight years uh, already. Time flies. And um, we'll see how long. Uh, let's keep going until they tell us something different, eh? <laughs> So today for the scripture reading, scripture reading, I would like you to turn with me to John chapter 10, verse 9 to 10. If you can, please turn with me to John chapter 10, verse 9 to 10. To bring our minds back to the fact that this church is not just this building, but this church is an extension of God, and we are the church. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. 
Today, I have my very good friend, Lino C, who actually lives in Singapore, but functions in the United States time zone. All right, he's actually currently, he was supposed to fly over to Andrews for his studies, but uh, I want him alive, and I, I'm glad he's alive, so he's not going to go yet. Uh, <laughs> he's going to stay here for a while. I'm not sure exactly when he can go, but we're glad to have him here with us this morning. And this is the first, second time, first time that we're welcoming. Do you know he's from ASDAC, guys? He's actually from SAUC, ASDAC, and um, come full circle, and today we can't wait to hear from him. Lino. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, so James is right. It's been about five years since I've been here. The last time I was here was when Chris Vogel was here. I'm not sure whether you remember who he was. Um, there was a Bible school, and I was one of the guys that attended the Bible school when I was here. And five years ago, five years ago, I was, my life was totally different. Right now, I have two children. Um, they bring me a lot of joy. But at the same time, with young kids, you know you, you are too tired to actually experience that joy. So we live uh, from twilight zone to twilight zone, right? Uh, never fully awake, never fully asleep. Uh, those with young children, I think you still remember. And... Um, so today is appreciation. I had no idea, but James, and I call him James because I think um, as someone that has gone into ministry, um, having a close friend in ministry um, is a gift uh, from God. And so James was one of those that God uh, used to, I would say, drag me into ministry uh, as I was running and running and running. And I uh, received the call. I was like, no way. God, find someone else. Um, I think James. So, um, he's a good friend. Don't know whether I should thank him for that. <laughs> but, yeah. So, my title of the sermon today is Fully Human. And it's after one of James's favorite class. Um, we call it Revelations and Inspiration. <laughs> what is that about? It is the class that blends your brain into jelly after two hours. Um, it's about how the Bible was written, how God actually inspired the writers to write, and how did they write, right? And I just finished that class. Uh, school just ended on Thursday, two days ago. So um, this is really me unloading it on you guys, right? So I hope you'll be blessed. And uh, before I continue, will you pray with me, please? Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this Sabbath, Lord, that amidst all the difficulty, all the troubles, all, all the hustle and bustle, Lord, that we can slow down and we can come to a stop to remember that you are our God. And more than that, Lord, you are our living hope and that whatever circumstance that we live in will come to pass, Lord, because you have promised that you come for us. And so on this Sabbath, I pray that you will cleanse me, Lord, that through the foolishness of preaching, that we will be able to hear your words of wisdom, Lord. So may you use me and may you speak through me, Lord. In all this, I pray in your most precious name. Amen. Amen. So, today I'm going to talk about the Bible. How was it written, right? Have you ever wondered... We have this Bible, we believe in it, so many have given their life for it. But at the same time, it was written by sinful men. How do we know that? It's interesting, they documented their own sins as they were writing the Bible. A lot of them wrote the things, the, the, the things that they would normally hide in the Bible and they wrote it. And so we know there were sinful men and, and how is it? that sinful men can write something that we now perceive as divine and we're willing to follow and say, hey, you know, everything in the Bible we follow. How is it possible? Well, before I go into that, I want to share three perspectives. One of them will be the Adventist perspective, but two more other perspectives um, of 
Christianity that, and, and their belief on how the Bible was written, how God actually gave them a, the information and the contents um, to write. And so the first, I call it Perspective 1, I don't want to name call, uh, it started right in the beginning. Right, we know that when it started, there were three great philosophers. You have it on uh, your screen right now. The first was Socrates, and then his prize student, Plato, and then Plato's prize student was Aristotle. And so they continued to pass on this legacy of uh, philosophy. And through these three great philosophers, Greek civilization and the philosophy and the mindset actually spread through the world, through Alexander the Great, when he conquered. And so much of our world, even the way we think, the way we like abstract thoughts, actually comes from these three guys. Right? And so as the church grew and we, um, they struggled to actually interface between the Hebrew mindset and the Greek mindset, um, two Christian philosophers, the one on the left, he's uh, Augustine, the one on the right, uh, Aquinas, they started to write. And what they would do is they would convert actually the Hebrew mind into Greek pictures, Greek philosophy, right? And as they were writing, one of the main challenges that they would actually come into was that Greek divinity was very mixed. It was very yin and yang, if you understand. They were like superheroes, you know, they were good, they were powerful, but at the same time, they would always have a little bit of um, their sinful side. They would give in to certain human tendencies. You know that from Zeus, um, he is the god, but you know, once in a while, he'll come down to earth, uh, he'll see a lady, and then we have Hercules, right? That is half god, half man. And so these were Greek gods. And so in order for Augustine and Aquinas to separate the Christian god, which was fully sovereign, they actually pushed for this idea that God, the eternal God, is a timeless God. And James knows this because his lecturer um, used to say, the timelessness of God. Uh, Man, okay. (laughs) And so, what does a timeless God mean? Well, a timeless God just means a God that is eternal, and so he cannot interface with time. Very abstract. Um, But follow on with me. So, if a God cannot experience time, because, you know, time and him just cannot get along, he cannot actually experience change. Why? Why? Because for change to actually occur, you need two points of time, right? You need a before, change, and then after. That's how you quantify and qualify change. And so, if he's eternal, then God cannot change, right? And if he cannot change, he too cannot experience changing emotions. Because that is change. And and because we live in time and space, and God is eternal. God cannot actually come into our reality. He's apart from us, right? And um, what happened as a result of this mindset was that in order for a timeless God to actually still do good works, to actually still help us to carry out His plan of salvation, it would need to be predetermined from the beginning. When God created time, He predetermined everything that would happen from the beginning. So that was logically what they believed. And um, I don't comment too much about predetermination, but if that is what we believe in, then what Satan did was just merely a part of God's plan. Because God willed it from the beginning that Satan would rebel. And now you see we have a huge problem, right? 
But, well, as a result of this mindset, how did the writers write the Bible? Well, the writers would have their intellect elevated. Why? Because man cannot understand timeless truths. And so we will be like, you know, our, their intellect will be turbocharged to be like superhuman. And then they will receive epiphanies, timeless ideas, only timeless ideas. And only timeless doctrines in the Bible are eternal. So God is love. That is an eternally uh, inspired truth. Um, history, not inspired. And we know our Bible is filled with history, right? And then, so not all the Bible will be inspired. And then what else? Lastly, the writers are seen as God's tools. What does that mean? It means they just write what God tells them to write. They don't need to comprehend it. They just need to write it. We call that word inspiration, but they just write, right? And... As, as hard it is to grasp, uh, move with me to perspective two. So this was, perspective one was actually what the church believed in for a long, long time. And through that whole process, if you were poor, it's because God willed you to be poor. There was no such thing as charity at that time, right? Social justice is part of God's plan. If I'm successful, God's plan. If you did something wrong, God willed you to be wrong. Just have faith. That was a perspective as the church progressed. And then came the great awakening, the great enlightenment, when the scientific mind started to form and perspective two happened. Right? So perspective two, they started with the same starting point. God is also a timeless God. But this time, they argued that, you know what? Human knowledge can only be understood in space and time. Right? Human knowledge. So your conscious thought, your conscious thought can only be in space and time. And so what does that mean? Consequently, they said, God cannot transmit divine knowledge, tr divine information through knowledge. So because God is eternal. God's knowledge is eternal and timeless. Uh, our knowledge is time-bound. They are incompatible. And so the only way for God to actually um, communicate with men must be through deep emotions. So it's not a conscious thing. It's a feeling, a feeling of deep dependence. Like, you know, one day you wake up and you feel, oh, I feel like God is telling me something. That's it. That's the only way God can tell you something, right? Deep emotions. And the writers would write out of this feeling of dependence on God. And so as a result, no knowledge is actually transmitted by God. Um, they are only writing from deep emotions. And from this train of thought, pantheism and pantheism started um, what does that mean? It means the idea that God is the world. The world and God is one. And as the world grows, God grows. Or God is the universe and the world is part of God. And as the universe grows, God grows. Right? Uh, I know, a bit abstract, but this is Greek philosophy. And everything is subjective. Why? Because only deep emotions matter. For those of us that have been uh, in the Adventist church for a long, long time, that is one of the reasons why we are so adverse to just emotional worship. It was because of this train of thought that came down. If I feel, it must be from God. And that's all. Because only deep emotions are divine. So what do Adventists believe? What do we believe? Well, first, I'd like to read two parts of the Bible from Scripture. The first says, All Scripture is breathed out by God. This is found in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 to 17, by the way. Um, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God 
may be complete, equipped for every good work. How much of Scripture? All of Scripture, right? Let's look at another verse found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 to 21. It says, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from what someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We have verse after verse after verse after verse in the Bible, right? Actually telling us how the Bible was written. And so what do the Adventists believe? Well, first and foremost, in this principle called Sola Scriptura, you would have heard it. It means only the Bible. And the Bible is our rule. And not just the Bible, because Perspective 1 and Perspective 2, they, they believed in the Bible, right? They actually read the Bible. But the difference is this, Tota Scriptura, the whole Bible, not just part of the Bible, not just certain sections, not just the divine parts, but the whole Bible is written by God. And so, if we read the Bible, case in point, Jesus Christ, He came to earth, He mingled with men, he talked, he said some things, they were all recorded. We know that God enters into our time and space. And God can interact with us. This is what Adventists believe, right? And how did God actually get the writers to actually write the Bible? Two huge ways. Uh, supernatural and natural. Okay. But with supernatural, there were three key ways. The first was Theophany, which was by miracles. And we see that in the burning bush when Moses met God. Burning bush, you know, as the Israelites were in the wilderness, what? They saw a pillar of cloud, a pillar of fire by night. Those were God's presence manifested in a miracle. And then we have prophecies. Um, you can read, it's in Numbers 12, uh, Exodus 31, verse 18. The verses are all there. You can go in and read it. Uh, where prophecy, where God makes predictions into the future, right? And He unveils His power through prophecy. And the last one is verbally, when God verbally speaks and they record it. So these are the three supernatural ways in which God actually helps um, the writers write the Bible. And then natural historical recordings. Now, this is important, right? You can check in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, Lamentations 3, verse 1. But historical recordings, every historical record in the Bible is inspired by God. So it's not just the interactions with God, but it is history itself that has the fingerprints of God. And anything that has the fingerprints of God is inspired. And so what do we believe? That both, not only part of the Bible, okay, or none, but the whole Bible is divine. And we believe just like Jesus Christ was fully divine and fully human. The Bible similarly, but not identical, is also fully defined and fully human. It was both. And so, as a result, there is actually no fixed pattern used by God. God uses any way. He is not restricted to a certain pattern as compared to perspective one or two where, oh, they must have their intellect. You know, you could be walking down, they could be walking down and they see God doing something and they write, inspired. There's no fixed pattern, right? All of Scripture is divine, and this is important. It's influence and not control. Man was not used as a tool by God to write, but rather God inspired the person, right? We used to move from word inspiration where God gives us the words, and then they wrote, and then we move to thought, 
where God gave them a thought and then they, they wrote the thoughts down into human words. But the biggest argument right now is, is, not, is thought even good enough? Because God inspires lives and the inspired life writes out of inspiration. So that's what we believe. And the Bible, as compared to the other perspectives, doesn't, you know, they say that, you know, only a small portion of the Bible is uh, inspired. And that's all the divine acts that God actually did. Um, Jesus, history, that's all allegorical. It's not really real. Well, we believe that the Bible only contains a small portion of all of God's divine acts that he's ever done on earth. It is just the executive summary. So God continues to divinely act in our world. And everything is historically grounded, right? So we have the acronym NICE. <laughs> Alright? <laughs> and this is the verse, right? But before we read it, I just want to end with two reflections. You know, when I was growing up, I used to think, if I give my life to God, He's going to take away parts of me that will make me lose myself. Have we ever had that thought? I used to grow up and even now, at some level, I think emotionally, I still struggle with that. Like as, as I give this part of myself to God, ah, I lose what is unique about myself. And the end point of a fully devoted Christian looks exactly like the other person's version of a fully devoted disciple. And so it seems like, you know, as we become more devoted, we all look more and more and more alike and we lose our uniqueness. That was something that I struggled with so much. And as actually I did this class, I realised if God doesn't even take away the humanity of the biblical writers, why would he take away what's unique to me? Why would he take away parts of my personality? Yes, maybe he, he needs us to, to cut some stuff out, but that is not in creating uniformity, but that is in creating, that is in the work of restoration, rather. And so in trying to restore myself, in trying to restore all of us, to who he wants us to be, we actually become a fuller human than what we were before. The world tries to tell us, you know, be yourself, don't follow God, don't tell anyone what to do. But the irony is, if we listen to that, the world tells us another contradictory um, message, isn't it? Be yourself as far as it is, socially accepted. You, you can't really be yourself, in a way. They tell you to be yourself, but don't be yourself if we don't like it. That's what the world says, right? But God is saying, if you will let me work in you, and that's why we have so many parts of the Bible that says, abide in my works, right? We have the famous one that says, if you abide in me and I in you. Why? It is so that God can begin to work a restoration in my life. So that when I look at myself, it is not that I'm becoming less of Lionel, it is not that you will become less of yourself, but that you will become a fuller, more complete person. And the second, and so that's why we have this verse, God wants us to have life to the full. And the second one, is that for the longest time, I had a problem with faith. And I'll ask God, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll pray and I'll say, Jesus, it's so difficult to believe in you. If only I was there and I saw you face to face, I would have a stronger faith. You know, I'll go through life doing that. I'm not sure whether you do. 
And I'll say, hey, if only I saw miracles, if only I saw you part the Red Sea, if only I saw this, I would have more faith. Right? If only I was one of the 12 disciples. I don't know. There's so many reasons. But in starting this, I've come to realize the best representation of who God is is in our hands, is in your hands, is the Bible. And the unfortunate thing is so many of us, we read verses in the Bible, but we don't actually read the Bible. We know verses, but we don't really know the Bible. We don't read it, we don't spend time in it, we just quote it. And for some of us here, you know, maybe you've been in church for a long time and you've looked at others just like myself go, hey, you know, I'm committed enough in church. This is, this is the line I draw, you know. Uh, as far as my relationship with God is, this is as close as I want to get. Um, God, any further, I don't actually have the faith. And we look at that and we tell God, I don't have what it takes to believe more to take the next step. Or we look at each other and we look at certain behaviours and go, wow, how does that person live a life like that? I cannot. And we just look and we stay there and we wait. And we wait. We wait for our faith to grow. Well, I have a quote from Ellen White uh, in Selected Messages, Volume 1. She says this, If you refuse to believe until every shadow of uncertainty and every possibility of doubt is removed, you will never believe. The doubt that demands perfect knowledge will never yield to faith. And I read this about two months ago. For two months, um, this message has been on my mind. And I've been thinking, do I demand more results, more empirical evidence from God so that I can believe, so that I can grow in faith? Or am I asking God just simply to grow my faith? Because as long, and in this Christian journey, as long as we look to others, right, and we look at their, the fruits of their faith even, you know, looking to other people's fruits of faith doesn't really grow your faith for me, personally. All it does is sometimes it demoralizes me. How can this person do something like that? And we look at the Christian heroes in the Bible, right? How could they be like that? And we go, oh, I can't. Let's just stop here. And some of us have been in church for so long and we've grown comfortable with just where we are, that we've taken a passive step in growing our faith. Don't be passive. If today you feel a tug in your heart and um, you, know, you think God is asking you to trust, do it, right? Uh, you need help? Well, you're on Facebook, uh, you're here. Just WhatsApp James, drop a message in uh, Facebook, just say, I need help, I need some information, I need support, I need prayer, whatever you need. The worst thing you can ever do in your faith is to just take a passive stance and just wait. Passiveness in faith does not grow faith. It actually just stipends it. And um, I talked about you know, looking at other people's acts of faith. The only thing we need to do, honestly, is not to look at others and their faith, but is to look at Jesus Christ. And as we focus on Him, as we walk with Him, as we read this amazing book, and I've always thought it was a, a special divine book, but the part where God leaves humanity for us 
still intact, gives me so much hope, so much encouragement that God is determined to walk with us every step of the way. So today, I would like to end with this last appeal. Don't. Just don't be passive in your faith, all right? Um, if you feel something tugging in your heart and you need to move forward, do it. Because if we start growing our faith simply by looking at others, we will always, always find disappointment. But if we start by growing our faith, by looking to Jesus Christ, then no matter what happens, like what Ellen White says, you will have a faith that you will have doubts that will always yield to faith. And so that is my message for you. And I would actually like to invite the worship team for their song of response.
pray. Our deliverance, Heavenly Father, as we spend the rest of the Sabbath with you, Lord, we ask that you be close to us, Lord, that you will fill us with assurance for the week ahead. And so, Father, I ask that you will bless us and that you will keep us and that your face will shine upon us, Lord, and be gracious to us. Father, I ask that this week we lift up to you, Lord, that in every facet, every moment, we will know your countenance is upon us, Lord, and we will come to know the peace that surpasses all understanding. In your most precious name I pray. Amen.